That song explains why we are meeting here today. It explains the reason that we can meet today. None shall ever be confounded who on him their hope have built. We've heard testimony today from, from Tim and from Jeremy and Angie uh, of the hope in Christ. And that's the place that we find hope. We pursue this hope together in a church because that is the way God has chosen uh, to organize his people in local churches. And these local churches reflect the body of Christ, all the believers in Jesus everywhere. Now, we can't spend time together right now with all of our brothers and sisters everywhere. But there is a time coming, the assembly of the firstborn, the, uh, when we will gather uh, God's church God's assembly, uh, the called out assembly, and we look forward to that day. In the meantime, we have the opportunity to serve him. We serve him in the context of a fallen world. We serve him in the context of our own fallen flesh. And so uh, the conflict between right and wrong goes, uh, goes on uh, right now, and it even happens within us. You can go and read Romans 7 and see that. So the Lord has established a way for his people to have fellowship together and to have structure and order in doing so. We've been looking at some passages in the book of Acts that have been descriptive, and we need to distinguish between passages in the Bible that are descriptive and passages that are prescriptive. And prescriptive passages prescribe for us a course of action. They often are an imperative uh, voice. They, they come as commands, as instructions. Descriptive passages tell us what, what has happened, historical narrative and that sort of thing. Descriptive passages are helpful because they describe an event or tell us what happened. And the prescriptive passages are helpful because they are, uh, we, we apply those, um, those instructions and commands to our lives. We have the prescription then for correct thinking, speaking, and action. In our survey that helps understand God's will for how churches make decisions, we've covered two descriptive passages, Acts 6, 1 to 7, and Acts 15, 1 to 35. In both cases, we learn what happened in the context of a problem that arose which required decisions to be made. The problems in the two respective passages were very different. In Acts 6, the problem was internal, local, and practical. In Acts 15, the problem was external, universal, and theological. In both cases, however, the cast of characters included leaders, that is, apostles and elders, and the congregation. In both cases, the same pattern occurred. Leaders made decisions with input and involvement from the congregation. And in both cases, there is the absence of a percentage-based congregational vote as the final authority for a decision. In our text today, we have an overlap of the descriptive and prescriptive. It's very interesting. We have Luke's record of Paul's instructions to the elders of the church at Ephesus. So we are reading a description of a meeting that happened in which Paul gave prescription to the elders from the church at Ephesus. So while the, the genre that we're in, liter, speaking literarily, that's a word, <laughs> is descriptive, the description is of Paul giving instructions, giving testimony and giving instructions. And so it's an overlap, but it's very helpful. We can read Luke's description and learn about that situation in context, but the contact, content of this passage contains instructions that go beyond the local Ephesian church. Paul's address to the Ephesian elders contains instructions that generally apply to elders in every local church concerning the role of elders. We also see clearly that Paul thought of elders, bishops or overseers, and pastors or shepherds as different terms or aspects of the same office in the local church. So you hear the word bishop a lot around here. And you hear the word pastor. You hear the word elder. In this passage, they are used interchangeably. Luke tells us that the group that Paul summoned to himself were the elders the presbyterus is the plural of it, from the church in Ephesus. It's plural, one church, singular, 
plural elders. And then, and then his instructions to them, you will see that Paul calls them overseers. That's the word episcopus in the plural. Uh, the Episcopal Church comes from that word, and it means that there's a hierarchy of bishops. Bishops, then, the concept of this word, episcopus, or overseers, is a biblical term. A hierarchy of authority uh, from church to church or over a multitude of churches, that is not something that we see uh, after the apostolic time. The, the apostles were, of course, apostles for all the churches, which is why we read their writings even today. So the apostle Paul had authority as a commissioned apostle, commissioned directly from Jesus, and any local church needed to hear what he had to say. That includes Desert Ridge Baptist Church. Just because we are separated by time and space does not exempt us from following the apostolic message and the apostolic authority as commissioned directly by Jesus. And God has, a, has, has accounted for our time and space separation by preserving and writing his word, miraculously so. If you've never studied uh, textual criticism, you will find that what is astounding about the Bible is that we can know, we know that we have essentially the original, we know that we have the original words. There are thousands of, of manuscripts from ancient times and we can compare them and we can see, and it's, 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 it can be done. When there is a mistake, when there's a, an anomaly, it can be identified. And often when you apply the, the, uh, the discipline of textual criticism it has developed, uh, you find the reason. There's actually even labels for the reasons that there's an, a difference in one manuscript to the other. So I'll just sum all that up by saying we have God's written word as it was given, and we can, we can trust that we have the Word of God. The King James translators said it well. I'm going to have to paraphrase them because my Elizabethan English isn't uh, completely up to par, but what they said in their preface to the reader, which is not available in most copies of the King James Version, but you can find it online very easily, they said, the meanest translation uh, of the Bible containeth nay is the word of God. And the example that they gave is the, the king's speech to parliament. And every one of the translators who translate the king's speech to parliament to the ambassadors from the different countries are not equally gifted and talented in translating and in the turn of the phrase. And yet what they translate is still the king's speech. And so the King James translators have said that well, I believe. We have the word of God. We have the apostolic message that is commissioned directly to Jesus to instruct us. And we have an account of Paul's speech to the elders of, of Ephesus here. Now, all three terms, elders, bishops, and then the other one is pastors. It's the same word for shepherd. Um, uh, it's used as a verb here. And we'll see that in just a moment. But they're all used interchangeably. It's not the only place that they're all used interchangeably. 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4, you find these three terms used interchangeably. And you also find bishop and elder used interchangeably uh, in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 9. So there's no question that these are not different offices, uh, but they are words that describe the same office. So Paul summons the elders and he tells them, you who the Holy Spirit has made overseers or bishops, you are to, the ESV says care, but the word behind it means shepherd. It's shepherd. Poi, uh, poi main is the, is the word, or to pastor. Uh, in Spanish, we don't have two separate words for this. We only have the one word, pastor. So that's been helpful for me, because if you drove by a field and there were sheep out there and a Spanish speaker wanted to point to the, the person caring for those sheep, he would say, look, it's the pastor. And also, if the same person walked by and, and saw inside a church uh, the, uh, the person up 
preaching or teaching, he would say, there is the pastor. So we have separated pastor and shepherd into two different categories, uh, but it's the same thought. It's the same idea. That's the point of the word. So let's not separate it. That's, that's helpful for us to, to categorize things, but let's remember the reason uh, that the word pastor is even used is because of its connection to the word shepherd, because that describes what's going on, caring, caring for the flock. Amen. Now I want you to see briefly the setting of Paul's meeting with the Ephesian elders. I want you to see Paul's testimony in this passage. Uh, that includes a review of his ministry in Ephesus. It includes his description of the challenge of future ministry. It includes his understanding of this as being the last opportunity for instruction to these elders. It includes the instructions themselves, uh, which are boiled down to two things. Pay careful attention to yourself and the flock and be alert. And then we get the prophetic warning of Paul. Why do they need to pay attention? Why do they need to be alert? And finally, Paul's blessing, although it's not uh, in uh, order, uh, I did save that blessing to last because that expresses Paul's prayer for the elders there. So I believe we can learn what's expected of elders in a church. We can help to, to understand that. This passage can help us to understand. So let's read Acts 20, verses 17. As a matter of fact, we'll start in 16 to give you even more context. Context. Paul is on a mission journey. He's on his way back to Jerusalem. He wants to get there, and you'll, you'll hear that. Beginning in verse 16. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify you, to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care, and that's or to pastor or to shepherd uh, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Father, give us understanding by the illuminating ministry of your Holy Spirit. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. What a wonderful passage to read, to see the, the love and affection that had developed between these Ephesian elders and Paul. 
And that love and affection led Paul to say hard things, not to back away from saying hard things. And, and we need to remember that. So the setting here is in Miletus. Miletus was south of Ephesus. Uh, Paul was on his way to Jerusalem. We see in verse 16 that he wanted to get there uh, by Pentecost. He wanted to be at that festival in Jerusalem. And that just reminds me, and it's something that I encourage you to study. Paul did not cease being Jewish when he became a follower of Jesus. As a matter of fact, he felt it was fulfillment of being Jewish uh, to follow Jesus. And he continued uh, to recognize uh, what God's word had said about Israel and about being Jewish. And so he wanted to see and speak to the Ephesian elders, but he had a priority. So that helps us. An application here, the enemy of the best is often the good. The enemy of the best thing that you can be doing is often good things that you can be doing. Now, there are times when we find ourselves maybe just doing something bad. We don't want to do that. But often, especially with the followers of Jesus, maybe the enemy of the best is the good. And so we do things that are good and not bad, but maybe we're not doing the best thing that we could be doing. Paul here establishes a priority. He wants to see the Ephesian elders, but he feels compelled to be in Jerusalem by the time of the the Feast of Pentecost. And so his solution is to go to Miletus and from 30 miles away send word maybe when he was still traveling uh, south or uh, from, from one of the other coastal towns to, to have the Ephesian elders to meet him in Miletus, which was on the coast. And so he set priorities according to biblical standards because of the call of, um, uh, according to the call of God on his life. And we needed to do that. And then we also see his testimony. Now this is interesting. This is the only speech that Paul gives to Christians that Luke records. He records that he spoke to Christians. As a matter of fact, in the, the passage uh, preceding, uh, there immediately preceding and starting in verse 7, when the famous passage when Eutychus uh, fell out of the window and apparently died, but Paul raised him. Uh, it was a long sermon. Um, I know y'all have never experienced anything like that, but we have at least not had someone uh, that the sermon go on so long until somebody fell out. May the Lord grant that we not experience that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but that was going on. He's, he's on his way and he's meeting. Luke records that he preached a long time. But he doesn't tell us what he said. This is the only place in the book of Acts that we have Paul's message recorded for us when he is speaking to Christians. We have his sermon uh, in other places when he is speaking to unbelievers, when he's preaching the gospel. But here we have a message to Christians. And, you know, this is something that we experience more often than an assembly of, of unbelievers where the gospel is preached. One of the reasons that we do events uh, is that we might approach some opportunity where there is a group of people who need to hear the gospel and we can give some basic gospel instruction. We don't think that that takes the place of personal evangelism, but it is an opportunity uh, to create a situation where there are many people who need to hear the gospel and we can tell them uh, the basics of the gospel. Our society does not allow for, there aren't places where there are assemblies and people are waiting to hear some new message that they don't know what it's going to be that they hear. That was the standard, for example, in Acts 17, that society in Athens. It said the people spent their time going to wait to hear some new message. But that doesn't happen in our society, and so sometimes we have these events so that we might kind of create that situation, uh, invite some people to participate in some community event, uh, but we don't. We are careful to let people know who we are and that it's us that's doing it. And there's going to be uh, a Bible lesson involved. We certainly don't want to, to be dishonest about those things. Paul gives his testimony, and we find here some important things. First of all, he reviews his ministry in Ephesus. Uh, in verses 18 to 21, you see these highlights. I lived among you. How I, you know how I lived among you. He's able to, to say to them, look, you experienced it. You know me. That's very important. 
It's very important. If we're going to edify each other, and that word means to build up, if we're going to help each other grow in grace and faith, uh, we're going to have to be transparent. We're going to have to know each other. We're going to have to be able to say, you yourselves know how I lived among you. Listen, if you're not able to say to your brothers and sisters, you yourselves know how I lived among you, you need to make some changes and be willing to invest in the lives of your brothers and sisters. It's not just that we assemble together and then forget about each other. That's not church life, biblically speaking. So he's able to say that. I lived among you. You know how I lived among you. Serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, with trials. He's being honest, isn't he? This is what ministry looks like. This is what the Christian life in a fallen world looks like. There are going to be tears and trials. That didn't stop him. Look at his testimony. I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable. And, and look what he says. Teaching you in public and from house to house testifying both to Jews and to Greeks. So he's talking about public preaching and teaching. He's talking about private preaching and teaching. And he's talking about everyone, both Jews and Gentiles. Paul, at this point, understood his role as the apostle to the Gentiles. He was not struggling uh, with, as Peter did early on, when you read in Acts 10, the very notion of going into a Gentile home. Paul talks about it right here. I went house to house as needed to teach you everything that was profitable. I didn't hold back anything that was profitable. You see, he, he, he said everything that needed to be said. And then over in verse 26, he says, I testify to you this day, I'm innocent of the blood of all of you. Now that is an amazing statement that he could make. The only reason he can make that statement is because he did not shrink from uh, holding back anything. He did not hold back anything that was profitable. And the way he says it here is, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Now, church, this is one of the reasons that I'm committed to exegetical, and that means taking from out of the text what we find there, not showing up with our uh, presuppositions and trying to fit them into the meaning of the text. Instead, we take it out of the text. Expository preaching. That is, we go to a passage and we say, what is there? So that God sets the agenda. And you know that usually we uh, are going through a book. We're in the middle of James, but we're taking a time out to look at the topic, how, does, how churches make decisions together, so that we might make sure that what we say and what we do uh, lines up with Scripture. And that's why we're doing what we're doing right now. But even in, in a topic, when we approach a topic, we must go to the text and say, what is here? What is God saying here? What's happening in this text? What's the content of this text? What can we learn from this text? And so and that's what we need to do. And that's how you study the Bible, by the way. That's how you study the Bible. You don't just read it and let it magically pass over you and say, well, that'll help me be blessed today. No, what we need is understanding. We need to love the Lord our God with all of our minds, with all of our minds. Um, and, and Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, about the Father. We have to know him. And that includes know about him. So, so don't try to skip theology and doctrine on your way to a, relation, a genuine, authentic relationship with God. You don't know anything about Him. You don't have a genuine, authentic relationship with Him. And I can prove that to you. It's, it's necessary. It's part of it. If I told you that I have a genuine, authentic relationship with my wife, she means the world to me. I love her so much. And she said, really? When were you married? Hmm. I don't remember. Oh, uh, well... Uh, uh, where did she grow up? I don't know that either. What color eyes does she have? I don't know. What's her favorite thing to do? Don't ask me. There's no way I could convince you that I have a genuine, authentic, loving relationship with my wife if I don't know anything about her. So please don't think that we can have a genuine, authentic relationship with God when he's provided all of this written Word of God for us, and we don't know anything about Him. Well, it's just, you know, I don't have time. 
Listen, study the Bible and study it as an expositor. The idea is to expose the truth. Do exegesis. Take from the text. And you just ask yourself, what does it say? So he's testifying. I am innocent of the blood of all you. How can he make that claim? He says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And the idea here is you don't skip any of it. And let me just tell you, there's a lot of it that's going to make you uncomfortable. A whole bunch of it is going to expose things in you that are not pleasing to God. That's the process of sanctification. God is glad to meet you where you are, but he is not okay to, to leave you that way. Romans 8.28 tells us that it's predestined that he is conforming the people of God into the image of Jesus. That's, that's what he's doing. There's no exception to that. If you belong to God in Christ, he is conforming you to be like Jesus. That is his will. Doesn't matter what your occupation is. Doesn't matter what you're doing. That's what God is at work doing. His goal in your life is to make you like Jesus. And one day that will be accomplished completely and perfectly when we have glorified bodies. And, but in the meantime, what do we do to help? When we gather, we do not shrink from declaring the whole counsel of God. We need to know everything that God has said, not just our favorite parts. The shrinking back from declaring the whole counsel of God has gotten American Christianity into trouble because we have moved from uh, trying to make disciples to make decisions. And we've moved from seeing Jesus build his church to seeing men build great crowds. And drawing a crowd is not hard. That's not hard. Only Jesus can build a church. If we're going to see a church built, what we have to do is to not shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God. Amen. And so that's going, to make our view, that's going to make us unpopular with people who don't like the whole counsel of God. That's the majority of people in the world. So if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be unpopular with most people in the world. That's why there's tears and trials. Nobody has ever been persecuted because they went around saying, Hey, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Jesus didn't go around saying that. That's not why the Pharisees said, We've got to nail this man to a tree. No, he told them the whole counsel of God. And when you do that, the line is drawn. That's what Paul said. And that's why he could say, I'm innocent. If someone has chosen to oppose God, that's on them. I told them what God has said. I told you, he says to the Ephesian elders. So that's his testimony. So he reviews his ministry there. Look what else he says. Verse 31. For three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. That word admonish, that's a strong word. He didn't suggest to everyone that they might consider obeying God. He admonished them. He said, repent, obey God. He admonished, and he did it with tears. Verse 33, I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. And in 34, he says, you know that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who were with me. Paul was a tent maker. Now, there were times in his ministry that he was supported by churches. He thanked the Philippians for their support. Uh, but when he was in Corinth, for example, and now we see in Ephesus, he did not want his opponents to have the benefit of being able to say, he's just here for your money. He's taking your money. In some places, he did take money from other churches for support. And he also wrote to the Corinthians that those who preach the gospel should make their living by the gospel. And he said uh, to Timothy, who is at Ephesus, to remember the elders who rule well, uh, honor the elders who rule well, especially those who labor, and that word means labor to the point of exhaustion in preaching and teaching. See this, again, we see the importance of not shrinking back from declaring the whole council and teaching publicly and from house to house, teaching and preaching. This follows the pattern of Jesus. When you, uh, you know, we remember often the feeding of the 5,000. Go back and read that account. And what you'll find is that, that the gospel actually tells us that Jesus had compassion and saw that they were like sheep with no shepherds. The next word says, so he 
taught them. And then later, because it was time to eat and they didn't have any food, he gave them food. We are amazed by the miracle of the, the, the bread and the fish, the multiplication. But what you find first is Jesus had compassion on them, so he taught them. Paul said, here's my ministry. I taught you. I admonished you. I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And I did not do it for money. I did not do it for money. And to make sure that you understood that, I worked with my hands. Now this means that the schedule, like in Corinth, was a very full schedule. Apparently, the idea of a siesta is not only Spanish, but, but when you look into history, uh, back into the, the Mediterranean world in uh, Corinth, it was like when, when the scholar said that more people were active at 1 a.m. than 1 p.m., probably. So it was customary that in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, you rested. But one of the Western texts, we don't know if it's original, but when it talks about uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians, or rather in Corinth, and we find that in Acts 18, that he, had, he went and daily instructed in the lecture hall of a man named Tyrannus. Now the lecture hall wasn't constructed for Paul's use, it was already there and he used it. Which probably means he used it when it wasn't already being contracted out to be used. And one of the Western manuscripts uh, says from the fifth hour to the ninth hour or something like that. So four hours in the middle of the day. So apparently Paul worked in the mornings. And then when the society said, all right, it's time to take a few hours off and rest, he went and he preached. And the believers also uh, bypassed their nap time and went to hear the instruction from God's word. So that was a big part of his ministry there. Look at the challenge of future ministry in verses 22 and 23. Now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. So he reviews what he's been doing, tears, trials, and he looks at what's in coming up, imprisonment and afflictions. Now what kind of advisor would say, man, you're doing great. Just stay on the same path, Paul. You'll have more tears and trials. You'll have afflictions. What more could you ask for? Listen, what we have coming is not in this world. It is to come. Well, it is in this world. We get a taste of it. But the reward in its fullness is coming with Christ. That's what Paul was devoted to. It's worth it. It's worth it. This is why he would say to the Corinthians, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. I mean, this is a joke. If this, wh wh who would sign up for, listen, put yourself at odds with most of the people on the earth, experience tears and trials and afflictions and imprisonment, and then you die. And it's over. <laughs> who would do that? But what about this? Listen, there's tears and there's trials. There's imprisonments and there's afflictions for a little while. But after that, glory for all eternity in the presence of God. Now it's worth it. Now it's worth it. We need to expect the same kind of commitment from elders in local churches. Indeed, from Christians in general. Listen to what Paul wrote to Timothy. Share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That's 2 Timothy 1.8 and 2 Timothy 2.3. 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Hebrews 12, thir uh, 12 and 13, these verses say, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Now this verse is between two verses in the same chapter of Hebrews that point believers to following their church leaders. That's where that example of Jesus follows. Remember your leaders. Obey and submit to your leaders. In the middle of those two verses in Hebrews 13, 
Jesus suffered outside the gate. Let's go to him there. That's the challenge, but it's worth it. And then we see that this is the last opportunity for instruction of the Ephesian elders in verses 24 and 25, 36 to 38. They were believing together. They were rejoicing together. They were suffering together. This created strong fellowship and agape, that is unconditional, that is selfless love that builds others up. And that's what it's supposed to look like in a church. Not warring factions, not dissensions and strife, not people seeking to have their preferences and their ways best. When we, when we get in this togetherness life, then we see what had developed between Paul and these Ephesian elders. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. That's what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. And so that kind of love and appreciation Paul even had for the Ephesian elders, and they certainly had it for him. Now his instructions are just in two places. So it's very simple to see what did he say? What did he say? His instructions are to the Ephesian elders, and we've already mentioned this, but I want you to understand. In verse 17, now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. In verse 28, he gives this instruction. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Another word in English for overseer is bishop. Sometimes you see the word administrator. Now, there is the idea of ruler. The, the person who provides uh, order and structure, that is what the elders, that's who they are. The Holy Spirit has made them overseers. And what do they do? To care for, to shepherd, to, to pastor the flock of God. That is what they are to do. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Look at that. Look at the order there. In order for an elder in a church to be the overseer that the Holy Spirit expects him to be and to provide the care, the shepherding, the pastoral ministry that he's there for, he first has to pay careful attention to himself, to his own person, his own personal relationship with the Lord. If an elder cannot preach and teach and lead out of the overflow of God's activity in his life, then you need to find somebody else to listen to. If it's not real in the life of an elder or pastor or overseer, you need to find somebody else. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. And to all the flock. Here's the shepherding idea. A shepherd, Jesus talked about being the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. When the wolves come, the shepherds don't even, the true shepherd doesn't even think about running for safety. He defends the flock. Amen. The hired hand, Jesus said, will just save his own neck, just run. But a true shepherd will not only pay careful attention to himself, but to all the flock. That paying careful attention to himself is not self-preservation. It's self-preparation for ministry. And then if that's happening, the flock knows it. And we can certainly say if it's not happening, the, the damage will happen in the flock. So these are, these are three terms that are interchangeable. Elders, Paul says you are overseers. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This is a reference to the call of God. A person does not accidentally elder in the formal office of it. Does not accidentally oversee. Now there should be qualities of eldership and oversight that are already happening that are evidence to everybody else that the Holy Spirit is calling them and leading them to that. But it is necessary that everybody agree who are the elders so that we don't go around arguing, no, 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 I'm the elder. 
I'm going to care for you. Sit down. We need to understand. We need to understand the Holy Spirit's involvement all throughout Scripture. In Paul's letters, he has a strong understanding and wants to communicate. The Holy Spirit gives gifts, spiritual gifts, to every Christian according to the role assigned to the Christian. And he gives the example of a body. All the parts of the body are important. Now, if I ask you, what is the most important part of your body? And you came up with, well, my brain, my heart, something like that. That does not mean you'd be okay. I said, well, come on up. We're going to cut your little finger off. I mean, it didn't even need to make your top ten. You're okay without that, right? See there? This has nothing to do with importance or value before God. This is a role. This is a role. And it comes with burdens. You've, we've been reading about Paul's tears and trials and, and all of that. Why does he give this? He gives a prophetic warm, warning. Uh, one other, in verse 31, he says, be alert. Be alert. Now, this is important because this is the same Greek word used by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24, 42 and 25, 13, the Olivet Discourse, to instruct the disciples about their attitude and behavior in the end times as they see the end times coming. Be alert. Be watchful. Stay awake. So we don't need to muddle through life just, oh, I'm a Christian, it's Sunday, I need to go to church. We need to be very intentional about what's going on. Did you know that the number one, really ultimate and, and only ultimate force in geopolitics is God? It's not a political party. The verse we have on the wall sums it up. From Him, through Him, to Him are not some things, all things. And when you read the back of the book, you'll find that God wins and those who belong to him win with him. Everything that's happening in the world is headed toward his appointed end. That's, right. that's what's happening. That's why we can trust him and just be obedient. So we need to be alert. Leaders need to be alert. Elders need to be alert. We should expect elders to be concerned with doctrinal and personal purity according to the standard of God's Word. We should expect elders to be watching and looking on the perimeter and see what, what's coming. And here we see the reason for it. It's near at hand. Look what Paul says in verses 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. You see there's a vacuum of the apostolic presence and the enemies take advantage the, the the apostle leaves he says after my departure fierce wolves savage wolves will come in they'll try to create confusion and draw disciples to themselves it says from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them has that happened in the history of the christian church that has happened you've had people say no 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 no, no. wait a minute let me correct that now you need to listen to me and you can always look and see what happened when people listened to that person. They enrich themselves and they gather power and they, whatever they want to themselves and they increase their own standing. That's what false teachers do. They see the church and the gospel as a means to get what they want. And they will come in and it has happened. We could turn on a television and find one today standing up with a Bible and explaining why the, be the more money you send, the better. That's their message. They may have some Bible stuff sprinkled in there, but basically it's mainly we just need you to send money. Send money. Just this is extra, but I thought it was interesting. I, a pastor friend of me told of a, a man that he knew who watched on television some one of these Word of Faith preachers saying, if you... Send me money. I'm praying that God will bless that gift 100-fold. And you'll receive 100 times back the blessing that you send to me. So this man wrote a letter and said, Listen, I don't want to put you on the short end of this thing. So why don't you send me $100 and then pray that God will increase that 100-fold to you and then we'll, we'll all be a winner here, right? Amazingly, the guy did not send him $100. <laughs> he sent him a nasty letter in response. That's what they're after. They're after self-promotion and they'll use the flock to get it. And this is why there needs to be 
the continuation of apostolic ministry. And what I mean by that is not that the apostles are here, but the apostles in the way that they have, under the Lord's instruction, set up order in the church. You know what Paul and Barnabas did when they went through the churches? They appointed elders in every place. So there's a standard. There's somebody. And the standard is not the elders themselves, but the elders as they are loyal to Scripture. The message is the standard. The word is the standard. They're coming, and they do come. Jesus said that they were coming. Paul said that they were coming. We need leaders to help us to guard the flock. Paul's blessing, verse 32. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Listen, if he were speaking to the flock and said, now I commend you to these elders and to their wonderful spiritual power, that wouldn't be a very good, safe place. But he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. God is caring for his flock. And he does, through, he does that through mediated leadership in churches, elders who are overseers, who are to care for the flock of God. This is how churches are to be led. This is how, the, this is the pattern. This is the description of what Paul instructed the elders at Ephesus. So this descriptive passage contains the record of his instructions to the elders here we learn the necessity that the elders pay careful attention to themselves and to the flock, that they be careful to shepherd the precious people of God, that they be alert, watching for the wolves that the Lord said would show up in sheep's clothing, arising from among the flock. Paul viewed the Ephesian elders as having been put into place by the Holy Spirit as overseers, that is, guardians or bishops, those who have the responsibility of caring for the spiritual concerns of the people. Put them in place to shepherd, to care, to pastor God's flock. It's needful in every local church that those chosen for this work by the Holy Spirit be recognized and then given the responsibility to carry out this task. They are to imitate the ministry that Paul exemplified. And this is what we need to seek at Desert Ridge. This is God's plan. This is how he wants his church ordered and organized and structured so that we might glorify him. The first thing, though, you have to be in the church, the assembly of God, the body of Christ. And if not, it doesn't matter if you're a member of a church or not. You have to believe in Jesus. That's how you're right with God, to trust him so that you submit Jesus' resume to God and not your own. Your own is not enough. But Jesus' per perfect person and righteousness is all you need to be right with God. Once you're right with God... We're in a church together to serve him. And that's what we need to do. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. I pray that you would grant us grace so that we fit the pattern of your word. Leaders make decisions with input and involvement of the congregation. But Lord, grant every local church, grant our church leaders, elders, who will pay attention to themselves and to the flock, who will have been chosen and called by the Holy Spirit to be overseers and who will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, care for, shepherd, pastor, your church obtained with the blood of Jesus, God the Son. May your will be done. May you be glorified at Desert Ridge Baptist Church and in all your churches. In Jesus' name, amen.